All right. Um, okay, so now what I'm, what I'm going to talk about is, um, I mean, part of the uh, Prime Minister's initiative is um, um, supposedly employing, um, um, improving employability for international students. Um, and if you look at the British Council's um, website, um, there's a section that talks about, um, I'm quoting here, strong expectations that a UK qualification will not only increase job prospects, but there, that there will be opportunities to gain work experience either during or after their studies. Um, so supposedly this is one of the draws, one of the attractors for international students. Um, and because of this, they say that employability is central to the UK's overseas marketing campaigns. In other words, these employability initiatives are ultimately about marketing British higher education to international students who are hoping to improve their job prospects. Um, and if you look at the kind of projects um, um, that are part of the Prime Minister's initiative, it's, it's things like virtual career fairs and other online initiatives to connect students with employers and recruiters, and then kind of informational materials such as guidance for, for um, career centre staff and guides for finding jobs in other countries. And, um, you know, as, as the kind of um, discourse about you know, international students working changes, we wonder if it will be more focused on other countries and less in terms of working in this country. Um, so the Employability Initiative is also connected to the National Association of Student Employment Services. Um, and they offer this thing called, uh, since 2008, they've been offering an International Student Employee of the Year Award, um, which is again a tool to attract international students. And, um, to also to promote part-time work alongside full-time study. And I'll tell you a little bit about the latest person, who, the person who won the 2010 award was um, Saskia Wichniewski from Germany, who studied marine biology at the University of Aberdeen, and whilst working as a hotel receptionist. Um, and I should point out that their definition of international student is, is this specifically a non-UK citizen, but it's different from the border agency's definition, which is a non-EU citizen. Um, so by the border agency's definition, Saskia would be considered a home student. Um, and then in the press release about the award, um, Saskia is described as a model service employee by her line manager, and he says, Saskia shows us the behaviors that, as a company we live by. The best characteristics uh, Saskia has is undoubtedly her attitude to life and to, her, to our guests and team members. She has a very positive outlook in life and is always interested in other people, whether guests or team members. Um, so she's kind of the perfect, perfect, you know, helpful service employee. But what's also interesting, I know this was her first-hand account, which reveals the financial difficulties many students experience. And she says, next to a flat, I needed a job as soon as possible, since I was under a lot of financial pressure. I never belonged to the students who got a loan or support from their parents, since my parents aren't able to do so. So like many international students, she has to work because grants rarely support study abroad, which is part of um, the kind of fault line where, where forms of state support are sort of within nation states, but are, you know, are not really international, um, or, or it's, it's very rare. And I mean, I'm just sort of speculating here, but I'm wondering if one of the factors in her winning this award was her ability to overcome financial hardship and maybe even show that it's possible to get a degree without funding at a time when state support is being withdrawn from higher education. Um, what's also interesting, and where we see the contradictions between these imperatives to sell UK education as improving employability, and even to hold up people who work to fund their studies as a, as a kind of shining example. And then we have the more uh, recent uh, media and policy discourses which position international students as stealing the jobs of British students and unemployed youth. And obviously, as we've heard earlier, this began a long time ago, um, as, as um, Bjorn talked about, um, and, you know, it includes you know, the actions of the previous government. But I think also more recently, we have to look at the term the bogus student as well. I'd also say the caricaturing of um, international students as these kind of rather naive, spoiled rich kids, um, which then make it very difficult to have any public sympathy. Um, and also as well justify the increases in fees. Um, you know, they're rich so, you know, they can afford to pay that amount of money. Um, and, and of course, more recently, we've seen the use of the term overstaying in the press which technically means being in the country without a valid visa, used for students who remain in the country through work or marriage. And so, according to this point, it's important to remember that, you know, staying in the country at all, even, even if technically it's, you know, entirely legal, um, and, 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 you know, working, are seen as dubious activities. Um, so the framing of international students within, you know, both these marketizing discourses, as in, you know, a lot of what Sue Ann's talked about with the um, Prime Minister's initiatives, as well as the securitizing discourses, and then we think about the recent media and policy debates, 
means that it's difficult to talk about international students as people or as legitimate members of communities, academic or otherwise. And one thing I kind of noticed when I was looking on the websites for the UK Council for International Student Affairs, as well as the um, you know, National Association of um, Student um, Employment Services, is that there's, it's all mainly about compliance with regulations, but very little about their rights, um, including their rights at work, and such as the minimum wage, such as freedom from discrimination, or their rights as part-time employees. Um, so I thought that was interesting. There's kind of nothing about their employment rights. Um, you think this is kind of really fundamental information that should be there. And they both simply have links to DirectGov, which is a government website with sort of generic employment rights stuff, but no specific reference to foreign nationals or international students. And of course, no mention of trade unions at all. Um, and why is this the case? And what we're suggesting is that these discourses that frame international students as cash cows, as indexes of global competitiveness, as targets of international marketing com campaigns, as guinea pigs, or more recently as bogus students who are seen as kind of scamming the system, sort of getting into the territory of you know, benefits scroungers, as we've heard, um, and who must be monitored and controlled, this is a form of objectifying them in a way so that it becomes very hard to think of international students as, as individuals, uh, as students, as employees who have rights and who have needs, and, and to where and to it's who, um, and, you know, institutions and employers actually have obligations. So what happens when international students face exploitation or discrimination at work and don't know um, what their rights are, uh, particularly you know, coming from countries where the situation might be very different and lack trade union representation? So I'll, I'll just conclude, and, and I'd say that um, in relation to, to research about points-based immigration, I think, and we, we think that a lot more work needs to be done to understand the entanglement of securitization and the marketization of higher education, both conceptually and empirically. <coughs> And in relation to campaigning, um, more work needs to be done to bring on board those individuals and groups who might implicitly support the points-based immigration system and or the immigration cap as a means of slowing down or stopping the marketization of education. Um, and international students are they're the most visible manifestation of the, of, in the marketization of ed higher education but are not the cause. And I'd also say that I mean, the media and official discourses on immigration, um, one thing we've noticed is they, they play xenophobia against imperatives to promote economic globalization, which might indicate why the loudest voices against the cap are all coming from the business lobby, such as the, C, you know, the CBI and that sort of thing. Um, but you know, why, why don't we hear other voices in, in the media about this? Um, but it's also very, very rare um, to connect the dots in terms of and bring it, you know, how do, we, how do we think of the marketization of education and the securitization of, of, of education as actually part of the same process? And in order to create the forms of solidarity that we, we think are necessary to promote, you know, to oppose both, both the marketization and the securitization of education, we think that this discussion really does need to take place. Um, and I think that we also, as well, I think we need to start thinking about education, or at least discussing it, um, um, as actually an international public good. Um, and also, I think we need a definition of public good that extends beyond national borders. Okay, so that's it.